Let's have a look at the Fuso starting grid. We've got cool, clear, but gusty weather out there today, and they line up in this order with Jamie Wincup, his 10th pole position of 2014. Will he knock off his 13 poles from last year? That's a question we might answer in Sydney. Next row of the grid involves Winterbottom, Mostert, Courtney, Van Gisbergen, Caruso, then Nick Perkat and James Courtney. These guys have been sneaking up on it all weekend, as you heard them say earlier on. Jason Bright, he hasn't quite got the car to his satisfaction. There's Mostert there, I apologise. I meant to Mark Winterbottom a little earlier. David Reynolds next in the queue, followed by Will Davison. Lee Holdsworth, who's on the move from Erebus to Charlie Schwerkholt Racing. Rick Kelly, who was in the USA last week. Jack Daniels Racing. Craig Lowndes, his worst ever qualifying here at Phillip Island. Fabian Coulthard. Some new colours coming on that car in a couple of weeks. Tim Slade, 17. Todd Kelly, season best result for him yesterday for Jack Daniels Racing. Robert Dahlgren. His car has been a pretty wild ride. Jack Perkins alongside him, unfortunately, loses that seat. Dale Wood, who's been quick on occasion so far this weekend. David Wall then, Scott Pye in the Wilson Security Cars. James Moffat, who, by the way, copped 25 points for an incident with Fabian Coulthard yesterday off camera. We didn't see that one. And uh, Russell Ingle at the rear of this group. It's interesting, Scafi, to take a look at the year-to-date podiums. We've had 102 total podium positions so far this season. Jamie yep. Wincup, combination first, second and third. He's had 19 of them. His teammate Craig Lowndes has had 15. Therefore, Red Bull Racing have had 34 podiums so far this year. And if you combine the Ford Performance Racing cars, Rod Nash Racing, Charlie Schwerkholt and the FPR cars, they've had 18. It just gives you a bit of an idea as to the sort of job they've done in the back half of the championship season. As you noted a little earlier, we've got nine cars carrying cameras for us this weekend and many angles within those cars. Winterbottom, Courtney, Wind Cup, just a small selection there. We do make a noise about this racetrack and the reason is because we love it. It is so rewarding to drive a lap around here. It's extremely fast, it requires an enormous amount of commitment and supreme delicacy as well because you can't upset the car here. It's the polar opposite to what you need to do at the Gold Coast where you fly the car over the kerbs, brush up against the concrete walls. Here it's gentle steering inputs by comparison to the seesawing of the Gold Coast and trying to coax the car, not overloading the front right tyre, which when you see those chopper shots explains vividly to you why the car is just forever turning around here. It's a little less than 50% of the lap is full throttle, but it's the amount of tyre stress in the story that will be a big part of how things are determined this afternoon, Brett. Neil, you hear it over and over again from the drivers how excited they are to be at Phillip Island. This is the sort of place as a spectator you come to and you cannot help but get butterflies. It's an exciting venue. Not only one of the jewels in Australian motorsport, it's one of the jewels in world motorsport. The crowd is pressed against the fence. They know they're going to see something special. Here we go, guys. It's going to be a great afternoon. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Barretts. And there's our chopper that's providing those wonderful images. And there is that shot from the south, looking up to the north, and the extreme roller coaster ride that is the main straight at Phillip Island. Downhill, 285 kilometre an hour run into turn one, depending on the headwind. Field coming into position. It's a little over 700 metres from the control line to turn one. Seen good clean starts so far this weekend. It's Wind Cup versus McLaughlin. It's a carbon copy of yesterday. McLaughlin gets a nice jump. He walked it away well. There wasn't too much wheel spin. And that beautiful thunderous sound in the background of the V8s on the run to one. Wind Cup down the inside. Scotty tries to round him up. That's going to be a difficult proposition. He stays with it. Hangs in there. Hangs in there. And forces the Volvo down the inside. Wind Cup's high and wide. Tander will buy into this. Jamie fared poorly in that one. They played chicken. The Volvo popped out the other side as the master. How was that level of commitment? And Wink Up ended up giving them a little bump. Scott McLaughlin, great job around the outside of turn one. And Tander has been the benefactor. Down the outside, he goes for a run around the outside at turn four. We're on board now with Wink Up. A little bump there with Tander. He's gone from fourth to second. The tuck in there for Tander was so close when he came off the hairpin at four because if he had touched that front left bumper corner on the Red Bull car, it would have rotated the HRT car across the nose. That was a great start to the race. And how has Courtney crossed up through turn eight, the hay shed? Cold tyres, too much kerb. He had the right side of the car on the grass and it bucked on the kerb. Scotty plays the wise move, he covers. Tander tried to actually jam it down the inside late. 
This is a great first lap. McLaughlin, impressive performance for him at two. He hung tough and held his ground. Richard Holway was very complimentary. His engineer and Courtney's in, leading a train of them. This is strategic. It isn't a problem for these guys. They're making this call. And there's the tail action in the middle of that pack as well. Plenty. There are a lot of bumpers, a lot of bumping going on. It's very hard to come off there so fast and get it slowed to 40k, Brett. Look, looks like Craig Lance. In fact, a lot of cars are on their way into pit lane already. Yeah, so we've got that big line up. There's about eight, maybe ten cars there. I'm just trying to grab that. It's Courtney, Kelly, Coulthard, Holdsworth, Lowndes, Slade, Dahlgren, Moffat and Wall. It's like a roll call at school. And it's front and rear bumpers to table 17, please. Because there were a lot of them that all made contact on the run into pit lane there. There was an awful lot of pushing and shoving as they all tried to make ground because it's a place where you can make cheap time, an easy time. They're looking to try and bolt over each other in the lane. Meantime, McLaughlin's got control on the left side of your screen. The mega wall shows you just what's going on in the lane and also out on the race circuit. If anything, McLaughlin's opened a margin now. Now remember Mark Larkham's race facts where he explained that they start with a lower fuel. They want to start to process getting the fuel on but they can't get it all on in one hit because of the tank capacity so there's a minimum of two stops in this race and the reason that it's so important to get some of the cars serviced early is that you don't want to because of the Phillip Island pit area it's very very confined it's quite a compact pit area so you don't want to get caught with double stacking if you can avoid it so already Red Bull have chosen to differentiate those strategies between lounge and wind cup. Remember, Lowndes qualified way back. Lowndes and Winterbottom are battling for second in the championship. There's 44 points between them. We're on board now with Jamie Winkup. What a wild first and second corner with McLaughlin. And then Tanda was able to get up the inside from turn two, right here in fact. He was up the inside of Jamie. He got around the inside. He then went down the outside of McLaughlin right here and couldn't quite make it stick. So McLaughlin was able. This is this very even start. This is your Gillette Mac 3 replay. There's nothing in this off the line. The two guys blaze down in here around the outside. There's been a little bit of chatter on the radio also uh, in the Red Bull camp about whether or not McLaughlin's leap from the line was legit. Looked okay from that angle, oh. but that was willing down there, wasn't it, at two? I thought that Jamie had him as they made the run towards two. But it was a brave move for both of them on cold tyres to stay with that. And then Tanda was very well positioned here. So this is looking rearward from Jamie's car, from the pole. So great start from Tanda because he was able to move it straight over. And you can just see the glimpse of the Volvo there on your right. But then as he goes into turn one, on the outside over there, there he is. Now check this out. He fires back down the inside and a little bump, bump, bump. And that allowed Tanda, because Wink Up was then wide, that allowed Tanda to get up the inside. And this is now the high speed run down to turn three. Winterbottom also buys in. That was a very willing first four corners. And now we're on board from the front shot. And this is the little bump. McLaughlin, very clever then. He didn't let Tanda run around the outside because remember, if he let him get around the outside, Tanda would be on the inside for this corner. Siberia, turn five. So, what a run. There's Roland Dane. I'm sure he held his breath on the way into turn two. When I saw that Gillette replay of Tanda just wiping across the nose of Windcup, it makes me gasp because that was seriously close to contact. Like it. Oh, I just wanted to add, if you're ever in any doubt as to why Scotty McLaughlin's going to be a future champion, there he is right there. I mean, we talk about it a lot, but that conviction he showed there when he was only halfway up Jamie's car. There's only two or three guys in this field that would do that get away with it. So being brave's one thing, but you've got to be brave and smart. That's another thing. Well done, Scotty McLaughlin. I'm a wrap for that one. That was well done. A lot of it, Larko, is about car control. And the thing about turning into Southern Loop is you're trying to take the pace off the car, slide the car at the corner, and you've got to contain how wide it slides. So he did that, he stayed on the inside, he maintained his position, and he was able to get around the inside of Wink Up. What an unbelievable manoeuvre at turn two. We're going to take a break. We've got McLaughlin leading from Tanda, Wink Up, 
Winterbottom and Van Giersbergen. That's your top five. Stay with us. Beautiful slow-mo image of Scott McLaughlin, our race leader, who's got 1.7 seconds over Garth Tander at the moment. The Valvoline Volvo, very strong in the first portion of this race. We go back to a Gillette replay now off the start from the second row of the grid. The point of view here is Mark Winterbottom. So that's Tander just sneaking across into third, moving to the inside. Up the front, you've got Wind Cup at the apex, and around the outside of him is McLaughlin. And they're all fanning their throttles and playing with the steering, trying to work out how you can do three wide at two. Then there's a bit of contact in the front row. Wind Cup did everything he could to hang in there because he knew that if he could stay right, he had the ideal line when they get to the hairpin. And all the time, it's profit for Garth Tander. Listen to Winterbottom having to just fan the throttle there because they don't have anything like the sort of grip you need when they're on cold tyres on lap one there as well. So they're not only battling for position, they're battling the behaviour of their cars. And they're doing 250 kilometres an hour at that spot. So when they're all vying for position, this is turn three, so this is where we saw the action just then, braking for turn four. Turn four is about 75 kilometres an hour. We're just looking down at Nick Perkett, just in, just in front is Caruso, just behind is Davison. I made the remark a little earlier in this race, just at the, the front side of it, about the shape of the track and why it punishes the right side of the car, the front right, the working tyre and the drive tyre on the right rear mark. And here, if the balance is not quite right, Mark Larkham discussed a little bit of this earlier in the day, you can really exaggerate your problems. So you can see how much work the right side of the car does here. That's one of the rare bits of relief. 70 kilometres an hour at the slowest point in that right-hander down in the bottom of the gully there at turn 10, call it MG, and then starting more of this whole turn left, turn left, turn left process. And the last turn, when your car isn't behaving, just goes on and on and on like a very slow day. And again, because it's so fast, when the car starts to slide around, it's 190 kilometres an hour there, and they accelerate all the way to roughly 285k just here. This is just a classic shot from our co-tire chopper of the layout and how the 
long corner profiles are so different to most of the tracks that we see around Australia. Isn't turn one a ripper though no. because it's downhill as the cars and the tyres have improved over the years they're getting further into that corner and they're getting the help today of a little bit of headwind too and then the actual camber of the road is positive which means you can tuck the inside of the car in there sit it just on the edge of the kerb and it's quite a rush. So the reason why the drivers jump out and speak with enthusiasm about this racetrack is that it gives so much back. Rear bumper cam here of David Reynolds. Todd Kelly's the one that's harassing him at the moment in the Jack Daniels entry. I saw one of the Red Bull cars run wide back there before. I think it was Wind Cup as well yeah, at turn it was. four. Because I think Frosty got a bit closer. This is Dale Wood, right-hand side of screen. Car 21. So the car that's actually best placed of those that have stopped is James Courtney. Remember there was a rash of cars came in to grab their first bit of the 120 litres of fuel that they have to drop. Reminder that the reason that's got to be broken into two is that the maximum capacity of the tank and the fuel lines is 112 litres. Usable fuel is about 109, 110 litres. So you can't get it all in in one hit. So you've got to decide how you break it up. There's one of the Red Bull cars in, as is Nick Burkett. I think that was Wind Tander. Cup. Tander in front and Wind Cup. Yeah, as Wing Cup just comes down the pit lane. I mean, I think this is fascinating. We've got two distinct groups of cars on two distinctly different strategies for the reasons you boys just explained. And what's going to be interesting is as we get into the race, those guys that stopped early. Now, let's just propose there's a safety car after our critical lap number 11, no, lap 12, 13, 14, 15, and they come in. That is going to change the dynamic of the race completely. So this one's going to go down to the wire and be hugely interesting. Safety car is only a medium chance of showing at this racetrack, roughly 50% odds. HRT process, now wind cup. We'll see how they fare relative to the first in the stopping queue, which is Courtney. They should come out in front, because they had track position initially. But Courtney did fare well from his stop. Garth Tander in the foreground, then Jamie wind cup. Not much in that, no. I reckon, in fact, HRT may have just snuck away a little bit, and here comes Courtney. Courtney, and he's got Rick Kelly right behind. Remember, they've got warm tyres, and they're at pace, so Nick Perkett sidesteps. Rick Kelly slides through. That was smart. Well done, Nick Perkett. He didn't move it straight across. When there's such a big speed differential, they're very, very dangerous. We've seen a couple of massive moments there over the last few years. And Perkat, although he moved it over, he's got good tyres. It'll take just a little while for those tyres to build up some temperature and some pressure. But Courtney and Rick Kelly, straight by. So the top ten cars are yet to stop. Led by... I was say McLaughlin. There he is. He just ruined that party. So McLaughlin and Winterbottom are now in. Van Gisbergen is the leader. Turn in now, mate. Now, they don't want to be undercut. That's the reason why they've responded. And the other way, I was about to say, sometimes it works the other way here because if your lap speed is slightly better than the in-lap of your competitor, a lap after is often the good thing to do here because it's so hard on tyres, you don't get the benefit from the undercut. So if you follow my logic, the tyres are hurt. If you do any more laps, you're slightly slower but your opening lap is always slower. So the thing that's critical, let's just look at this. This is this is Tander, who was second, and this is McLaughlin. So let's just see what happens. This is going to be very close. He's got him. And it's going to take a little while for tyre pressures to normalise for McLaughlin, so that's critical. So uh, 14 seconds of fuel, a little over 50 litres at 3.7 litres per second on the refill for the United E85. So in about half a lap to a lap from now, McLaughlin's car will begin to feel a little normal again on those tyres. Van Gisbergen is still the race leader. Davis and Mostert, Reynolds uh, and Ingle are yet to stop. Tanda looks strong, Neil, doesn't he? He did he yesterday too. Yeah. And at the back end of race 33, probably, well not probably, he did have the fastest car, but then it's a question of trying to figure out how to use it. He was very, very strong. Uh, you heard him say in the interview pre-race that they needed to really shift that window a little bit so that he was stronger earlier. That's about making minute tweaks on the car, oh! maybe tweaking pressures. And look at Percat on Kelly. Good move. He raised your blood pressure. It, it, it'll, it'll go back the other way here now. So watch this. When you're on the outside at turn eight, you need to hold your breath. And Nick Percat just has to fan the throttle. And in fact, being out there... Because you've got to come out of the throttle so much, he's actually given a couple of car lengths away now, so they'll need to resume that little battle. 
good over the top of the hill. Nick, he's got Craig Lowndes right behind, who's kind of been fumbled a little bit by traffic in this early stint. Perkett tries to run the outside now. We had a chat to him yesterday in the coverage. Oh, he might get up the inside here. He's close to doing it. He's done it. He's done it. That's actually quite a bold move. It's not actually done with yet. But he's got it there. He's placed a ton and a half in the right spot. But that quickly turns into being a problem on the other side of the road. They will be three wide into one. And have a go at Lowndes. He's almost motocrossing down there. He's rounded up on the outside. Got better corner exit speed. And there's a lesson. Craig Lowndes pops out the other side. Oh, what great racing. What absolutely fantastic racing. And they slowed each other up. So it wasn't a horsepower battle. Because Tander and Kelly compromised their line coming onto the straight, they were both slower. Craig got the toe, moved out, rounded them both up on the outside and gained two spots. A very experienced, nice move. Oh, Percat again up the inside of Rick Kelly. One of the reasons also why McLaughlin is behind Garth Tander is they took a little more fuel on Mark uh, by, by about three seconds, roughly by our calculations around about 10 litres of fuel. So it's slightly imperfect math when we try to reverse engineer it from in here, but that'll actually resolve itself a little further down the road as Van Gisbergen comes in now together with Will Davison and Russell Ingle. How's all the action today? End up cross-eyed trying to pick up everything here at the moment. It's all happening down the order. So what Neil was explaining is that it doesn't make a lot of sense with the gap from Tander to McLaughlin, given that they're only really a lap apart. But what happened as a consequence, putting more fuel in then will mean that he stops for less time at the next stop. So until they've made their final stop in this race, we won't really be able to work out for you what that proximity is. That's a gee whiz. And what you've got to hope there is that you can get it stopped, turned and tucked back in because if he stayed up too long, too high in the grey, he'd be in trouble. This was a terrific exchange between Nick Perkat, Rick Kelly and Craig Lowndes who got the perfect corner exit and as a result of that he had about another 8 to 10 kilometres an hour blew by and the Gillette replay tells the story but at one point there, CL, Lowndes looked like he was about to drop the left side of it into the grass. And that was quite a rush. And he still got it tucked back down at the apex of the corner at turn one. So just think about that, folks. It's 285 kilometres an hour. They're three abreast. The, the cars are moving around. They buff it around in the breeze. And Lowndes just able to get across and fire it in there. And the same thing applied the following lap with Van Gisbergen because Shane had come out of the pits. He moved it over to the right. And Lowndes had to be very bold to get into turn one and get across the front of Shane's Commodore. So Mostert now leaving only David Reynolds to stop. He's the leader of the race, Davey. Johnny, yeah. 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 Johnny, Johnny, yeah. 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 Johnny, Got a nice little margin over Scotty McLaughlin.
back at Phillip Island. It is the Plus Fitness Phillip Island 400, day two of racing action for V8 Supercars down here in southeastern Victoria. And we've got a beautiful day down here at the moment. Clear skies, a little bit of cloud around here and there, but not much. Very, very windy. And uh, you can see that we've got it covered from every angle. It's been relatively quiet at Cam's race control, thankfully, for those fellows. And we've got an interesting race going on at the moment because Garth Tamba has got a 2.3 second lead over Scotty McLaughlin. And the mega wall, as you can see there a few moments ago, we've got all the various angles covered around the racetrack as well, including this one. And David Wall has found the wall, unfortunately. Wilson Security Falcon. Just when I said it had been quiet at race control. And uh, unfortunate because he's been able to find reverse and uh, it's at the final corner there for David that's an interesting spot that's the final corner there we saw Greg Murphy have a really big accident there many years ago and it popped a tire when that happened for Greg Murphy but it looks like David Walls has gone straight ahead there there's got to be a mechanical failure that is fast look how fast that car's gone off it's gone right through the kitty litter and just bumped the fence so that has retarded the car enough check that out well it's north of 200 kilometers an hour as he commences the turn in there through that left hander in the final turn so because the safety car has now been deployed you can see how many people are laying up and reacting to this because this potentially gets them through the second mandatory part of their stop so they're all coming in this is going couple, to be manic. A couple of them were in a discussion about it, though. So uh, Tanda's going to lead them here. And who doesn't react to it is going to be the interesting thing here. I think they're all going to do it. Well, yeah. But that means that someone's going to lose in terms of double stacking. So Tanda, McLaughlin, Winkup, Winterbottom, Davison, basically everybody from 1 through 16 so far. Perkins, 17, 18. So, so far, to Mark's point, it's all. Yeah. I can't remember having double stacked here at all, so this is going to be ugly. And you can see now that Lowndes, I don't know what he's going to do with it, because he's going to stop the FPR car coming out. Oh, he's got in there far enough. That's good. I thought he was going to stop the FPR car. So, there's Tandy, your leader. There's McLaughlin. So, that actually hasn't changed too much. But Winterbottom has definitely jumped Wink Cup. So, that's a jump. And this is hurting Lowndes. You've heard that sentence before. Oh, look, and here it, we go. oh, are you kidding me? So Jack Perkins can't get in, and everybody behind him now is blocked. It's a narrow pit lane. Oh, a contact in the lane, so there'll be a, a penalty there as well. Reynolds and Bright have made contact. There just isn't enough room, unfortunately, there for everybody to manoeuvre. So those seconds there, for example, for James Courtney, and for Chas Mostert, double stacking, and for Lowndes, it's absolutely thrashed them. So this is huge in terms of championship implications because Winterbottom was able to get by Wing Cup. So a good move there. And this is the contact with Reynolds and Bright. That'll be an unsafe release. So David Reynolds will end up having to tour the lane. But Lowndes way back, Neil. So this is, this is huge. So the Pettis safety car is out while it's out and there's no racing. We'll take a quick break and come back. Steering. How is it on the inlet? Is that as though what's happening, mate? Yeah, you go, so I don't know what's going on today. The first time. What's steering on the inlet? Yeah, you see it, mate. You want to go drop the bell or something? Oh, Richie, 
Gorgeous image from the Coates Hire chopper looking back across the Turn 5 6 area of this Phillip Island Grand Prix course with Garth Tander leading. We're under the control of the Peters safety car here at the moment. And here's the double stacking scenario involving Red Bull Racing Australia. Wind Cup being serviced and Lowndes having to wait. Let's go down to the pit lane and find out more about it. Yeah, just watching it with Mark Dutton in the Red Bull garage at the moment, Mark. I know after Jamie won the championship, the next priority was getting Craig up in the second spot. That double stacking just doesn't fit, does it? No, exactly. But um, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, you know, there's no team orders. We can't tell them to let each other pass or anything like that, unfortunately. Um, with the qualifying effort uh, or mistake in, in qualifying from Craig, he was just unfortunately in that position. So Just hard luck. Hard luck, yep. Thanks, He'll race hard. He was going quick. Two around the outside. So this whole gang is now queuing up behind Tander and uh, Richard Holway was just on the radio a moment ago just counselling young Scott McLaughlin to make sure he understands the rules. We saw some drama at the Gold Coast for various drivers and we've seen it during the course of the year. So they'll wait for the call from race management on the race management channel, I should say, from race control that they're good to go. And they are. Uh, there was also that other awkward situation in the lane there before where Jack Perkins couldn't get in and we had that shot from Will Davison he was giving him a shove trying to get him out of the way. Incredibly frustrating if you're one of the drivers that's bottled up behind. That was a very good restart for both Tander and McLaughlin. They gapped Winterbottom, Winterbottom in third, Wink up in behind Van Gisbergen was right up close to the back of Jamie as they turned into turn one. We're on board now with Scott McLaughlin following Tander. What a good job, Garth. Started fourth. Made that early move on Wink Up. Thank you, safety car. We have a black flag for lane penalty for car 55. And lane penalty for car 55 for an unsafe release. And no surprise confirmation of what we speculated on a little bit earlier that that may be the case for David Reynolds, unfortunately. And uh, the contact in the lane there means that he'll have to come back down. gear 200 kilometers an hour when everything's just right through the middle of that right hander at turn eight when the tire condition's perfect you can be flat or very close to it but when it's anything but you've just got to play with the throttle a little bit to get through there good battle between james courtney and rick kelly james got hurt in that queue he's 11 and there's the pit lane penalty now being served to the bottle of falcon by david reynolds he can't take a trick there's his boss rod nash co-owner of the Ford Performance Racing team and they operate their two factory cars, the Ford Performance Racing Pepsi Max entries and the Bottolo car plus the Charlie Schwerkolt car. The Geldwin entry is operated by them as well. Oh, someone very wide. Kelly, Rick. Very wide. He turned in there. Just got you said they were battling there with Courtney. He turned it in and got wide, got out into the grey. It was right out sideways, gathered it up, but only just. That was unfortunate for Dave Reynolds. He was six when he came in. We're on board now with Rick Kelly looking back at Scott Pye. And on our numbers, and clearly you can't work the whole field out highly accurately as quickly as this just after the stop. But few, if any, got all their mandatory fuel on in our view. And Scott Pye just also struggling there with uh, Craig Lowndes right behind in car number 888. 
Um, there may be a couple that we think may have got the rest of their 120 litres of fuel on. We'll try and get you some accurate maths on that for the key runners at the front of the field, Tandem, McLaughlin, Winterbottom, Wind Cup and so forth. But it sets up the tantalising prospect as we've seen several times this year where they may not quite have the fuel to get there at the moment. And they've got to get that 120 litres on, otherwise there's penalties. You can't just suddenly decide to not make the grade in that regard. So Moffat and Mostert, per the your point, they actually came back in and put fuel in yeah, on the following lap to, to get to that, that number. Yeah. So, interestingly, that may serve them well. Although they're way down the field, they're in 22nd and 23rd, if the other guys have got to come in under green, they'll, they will benefit. And we think that there may be a few others that are in that gang that, that got it in and the, in that, the second stop, Scapey, without having to come in for the little splash after. But I'll try and get that uh, refreshed for you and understand it better. Here's Mostert. He was hurt, double stacking. The Bathurst champion, car number six, Pepsi Max Ford Performance Racing. He's got just a giant, solid metal wall of colourful V8 supercars in front of him at the moment. That's a big job. That is a very big job. Mostert, who drove so well at Bathurst, started last, broke the lap record didn't lead a, a lap of the race except the last 500 metres good enough to win Australia's biggest race the bit that mattered yeah, exactly incidentally Jack Perkins I believe is under investigation car number 18 gel when racing uh, for propping in the pit lane there but I don't know that he had much choice let's go to Rihanna David Wall, that looked very strange, that off for you. Just tell us what happened. Yeah, basically, uh, turned in like normal. I was struggling with the, the power steering, shuddering a fair bit. And uh, there, it looked like it's failed at the last corner, which is always nice. So, uh, yeah, we skidded off through the paddock there and managed to make the braking zone as long as possible. But that was about all I could do, passenger, unfortunately. Boys are working frantically to get you back out there. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Got to say also that the preparation of this race facility down here is absolutely five-star. And that gravel track did exactly what it was intended to do. It took all the speed off the car. David's there talking to us. No damage on the car. Speed arrested. Spectators safe. So to everybody that works hard here at Phillip Island to make that a reality, thank you. Yeah, well, that's an interesting outcome, boys, from all that strategy stuff going on. Uh, gee, look at that. That's busy down there. Lock up down into turn four. Yeah, Jack Perkins. Yep. Um... Now, we said, uh, had they taken that safety car, and it came right on cue, funny how that works out, isn't it? But uh, sure as it would be, it appears everyone has got their fuel in just. I looked at some of the, there's a little marker I can show you on the back of the fuel receptacles, and I can tell you they're down to the millimetre. So I assume some cars must have started a little bit lower than normal. And those first round of stops, remember some of them we thought was slow. I reckon they put a bit more fuel in there, and they've just squeezed in. In fact, Russell Ingle, I think, is the only guy that hasn't. So this is a race to the end. Oh, that's good intel. Thanks, Larko. There's nothing like eyeballing those fuel tanks down there. It makes our job a bit easy because we've got the chalk and the abacus and the calculators and the smouldering brains here at the moment trying to do it based on theory. I'll go with your view. You've got to work out the difference between the in-lap, the out-lap and the stationary time and then extrapolate what you think might be how much fuel they fuel go right. on. Yeah. Or you can go and have a look at the gauge. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Larko. Cheers, the Larko method. No, the Larko <laughs> method is very good. <laughs> Point 0.9 of a second is the gap between Garth Tander and Scott McLaughlin. Robert Dahlgren running a little wide there for Tim Slade, gifting him a position. We'll come back to Phillip Island in just a tick.
We're back at Phillip Island, and that's the great view from the Coats Hire Chopper. Don't forget the Sydney NRMA 500, the finale. It's coming up on 7 and 7, mate, on the 6th of December, 12.30 Australian Eastern Daylight Time. It'll be a beauty where we'll officially crown our champion of 2014. And uh, word from Cam's race control, no further action in relation to car number 18, Jack Perkins, for the pit stop. I don't think Jack had any choice but to prop. He needed to be somewhere and he couldn't make it vanish. Now, while we're away in the break, Chaz Mostert, the Bathurst champion, and James Moffat, both guys on the podium at Mount Panorama, they're in a world championship arm wrestle to the death for 21st and 22nd at the moment. And uh, it just underscores how much commitment and hard work is involved everywhere up and down this field at the moment because yes, it's stressful, isn't it? And uh, look at this, it went on and on and on, down at turn four, down at Siberia, and then again at turn eight. And Chaz had the huge slide. Everyone closed or covered their eyes. And the Mostets were, well, in the end, impressed, but prior to that, terrified. <laughs> exactly. And if you're wondering why Chaz Mustard is actually back in the pack there battling a little bit, he was the unlucky one in that, uh, that whole uh, safety car outcome. He, uh, he came in, they filled it up. He had to go back out, use up a little bit of fuel, come back in. They put the last sort of couple of leaders in, so he had to come back through the lane. And once you come back through the lane when there's a safety car already deployed and they're lined up behind him, you are gone. Yeah, that, that's what we weren't certain of, Like, We thought he must have done that because he didn't get enough fuel on board, and that may have been different to the rest of the field. So now that you've, now that you've been able to check for us whether the majority of the field got enough fuel, that is really going to hurt Mostert, as you said. Yeah, and sometimes it works, doesn't it? It was that strategy, exact same thing that Winterbottom did at Bathurst, which could have worked fantastically for them, but uh, wasn't to be. But I just want you blokes to know I've been down here on the pit lane for uh, quite some time now here at your service. Right? So don't, don't hesitate in asking again, eh? Oh, oh thank you. Yeah, I'm oh, oh, good. Yeah. When did you start being nice? Yeah, yeah. Just dial 1-800 Larco for a dudding. <laughs> oh. Position 5, car 90, 37, Shane Van Gisbergen. He's done a nice job. It's been a good recovery for him, considering yesterday was just a complete checkout horror story for him. His words, not mine. He said he drove like an idiot in that first race. I mean, it all just popped sideways on him in qualifying when he got together with Fabian Coulthard. But he's back in the game here now, getting some, some points. They're valuable points. Fabian Coulthard, who's also in that mix, he's down in 15th at the moment. Remember that we're far from resolved on second, third, fourth, and fifth in the championship. Mark Winterbottom's trundling along nicely here at the moment, also in third spot. Okay. And the guy that we haven't picked up really well yet is Will Davis. And what a good job he's done. He started 12th, is currently 7th, is in this pack with, with Bright and Caruso. He's done a great job. Just to quickly interject, Scope, it looks like for some reason they've got the passenger's window popped out of that car. I didn't notice that before, if there's been any conversation about it. But uh, on a big, fast aero track like this, that'll that create a lot of drag disturbance inside the cabin of the car. Mind you, it'll make it nice and cool. But it, is it my imagination or is it missing? I think it's missing. Yeah, I think so. Good pick up. So good battle there. Bright's done a good job also, three positions. Scott Pike, great job, 10 positions, and Russell Engel, as we said, because he serviced in the pit with a single bay, was a big beneficiary of the stacking in pit lane, and he's also up 10 positions. Mercedes sports car. Yeah. He's done a bit of open wheel work, Will, so he understands that feeling. Radio traffic there. That's an impressive shot, isn't it? The track looks great, the cars look good, the pace is hot. We're a bit surprised about the weather earlier in the week. Talking about full-on wet weather conditions yesterday and today. That hasn't happened. Here we are, Super Cheap Auto, Tim Slade, an on-board ride with him, one of nine cars in the field carrying our cameras. 
He's tucked right in behind Dale Wood, who had a little moment just there at turn two. Let's enjoy the ride with Tim. driving in the cabin when they went over the top of the hill there and uh, Slade had a big shot at Dale Wood, got it done but it did stop our hearts momentarily Craig Lowndes here behind Rick Kelly, remember they had the monumental battle for the championship at this location in 2006 and a bit of controversy surrounding that one, another quick break here from Phillip Island, Garth Tander's got a margin of just under one second at the moment from Scotty McLaughlin and then Mark Winterbottom, Jamie Winkup and Shane Van Gisbergen. It's a magical image of the Phillip Island Grand Prix circuit looking across to the northwest and the west Port Phillip Bay, Western Port Bay, the Southern Ocean surrounding this whole area. 
and uh, it's just beautiful at this time of the year. There's a bit of green grass around and we're seeing some wild motor racing this afternoon because Craig Lowndes, full sprint car action for him through turn eight. He's in a huge battle here with Rick Kelly. And, uh, they're old rivals and Gillette Replay just shows you how much Lowndes is pushing on here at the moment. These fellas, by the way, are battling for 11th and 12th position. Back with live pictures now, and they're still battling. Meantime, at the front of the field, Tanda and McLaughlin continue to trade very quick laps as well. They're pretty much in a zone of their own for pace, although right. they just said to Wind Cup a moment ago, they will come back to you, mate, so be patient. So they're playing a strategy where they're trying to make sure they look after the rubber on car number one. Here we are. There's the leaders, Tanda, McLaughlin. Then the gap back to Winterbottom in the Falcon. There he is. We'll check these gaps for you. So that little margin that you can see between Tander and McLaughlin, that's pretty much one second, and it's been that way for a while. We'll sit with these guys, then it's Winterbottom, there's Windcup, Van Gisbergen, then a breath of fresh air back to Jason Bright. Nice job for Will Davison based on his qualifying. Michael Caruso, Percat, Courtney, Rick Kelly, Lowndes, Pye, Holdsworth. And uh, Todd Kelly, Fabian Coulthard, then Tim Slade, we rode with him. Chaz Mostert, James Moffat, Dale Wood, Robert Dahlgren, Jack Perkins. That gets us back to 20 seconds. So the only fellas behind that lot include David Reynolds and Russell Ingle because David Wall sadly had some problems, went off the road at the final turn. He's in the pit lane with a power steering issue with that car. And David Reynolds served a pit lane drive through penalty for the unsafe pit release. And what a great battle. That was a great shot of where they are in terms of proximity from Tanda to McLaughlin, but also the gap back to Winterbottom and Wing Cup. And as you said before, Neil, they're coaxing Wing Cup because they think their tyre life is the best in the field. They showed it yesterday afternoon. So he'll probably come forward as this race closes in. But what about also the fastest down the inside goes Lowndes. Oh, gee, that was close. That was so close to making contact. They would have turned Rick Kelly straight around at MG then. He was down the hill. He had the wheel locked battling to get there, but I was about to make the point that this is the fastest circuit and hardest circuit on tyres in the country. The most aero-sensitive circuit of the lot. And we've got five manufacturers in the top eight. All five manufacturers down to Caruso is the lead Nissan in eighth position. Eric Pender was on the radio encouraging Rick Kelly. Craig Lowndes bought himself a first-class ticket to almost an accident over the top of the hill there before. He's sitting right on the edge of it. He wrestled it over the top of the hill, locked the rear brakes, and he skated all the way down the hill into turn 10 and only just managed to wrestle it out the other side. That was wild. Garth Tander, the leader. It's still jammed on just under one second, this margin. It's a fascinating battle.
This is an illustration of how important it is to qualify very well and not have a single interruption during your race because we're watching Craig Lowndes, who yesterday in our first race, if you watched our coverage of race 33, he pressured Scott McLaughlin all the way to the flag for a second. Today, didn't get away as well as he wanted to, didn't qualify quite where he needed to, got held up in the pit lane. Now he finds himself in a monumental battle with this man we're carrying Onboard cameras here with Rick Kelly, Jack Daniels racing. They're in a monster battle at the moment for 11th and 12th. And in this field, the way it is at the moment, if you aren't able to be positioned ideally at the front, it's near impossible to be able to just magically pick yourself up and jump to the front. So this is down at turn six, it's called Siberia. It's out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Not wrong about that, if you go off, you're in Siberia. That's the dash there. It's a weird shot, this one, because it's very active steering or the dash display is on the steering so you can just see that weird movement and the way that you're trying to concentrate on knowing what the number is for the gear change and also what that rev limiter does because that comes up on the stalk just up in top on your right there just in front of Rick the numbers are so there's the lap speed so there are 34 is what it's forecasting it's two it's two point Sorry, 3.09 away from what they were putting in as their datum lap. The top is the brake bias, and the bottom are the front and rear anti-roll bar settings. The big number on the left, obviously, is the gear. That's sixth gear back to fifth for turn one. And uh, it was interesting, Rick was tilting down at the precise point you needed to see the data, and the reason is because he needs to see the data as well. That's so right. he's looking at all that information, he's thinking, that's when you hear the radio calls, think about your bias, think about your bars, that's what that's all about, because they know that both those things, the brake percentage front to rear and the control of the anti-roll bars is something that you phase and change as the race progresses. Let's keep an eye on Scotty McLaughlin and Garth Tander. I'm with Adrian Burgess. Adrian, great run by Garth. Can he hold Scott out? Yeah, of course we can. Um, at the moment, we're just we're looking after the car, looking after the tyres, but yeah, young Scotty's having a push, which uh, you know, we knew he would do, but uh, hopefully at the moment we're under control. Good work, Adrian. Thanks. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Well, that's the correct answer when you're inside the Holden Racing Team bunker but the reality is that right at the moment inside Adrian Burgess's mind he's thinking holy hell we don't need this pressure at the moment because that margin's closed quite a lot almost half what it's been in the recent past so a bit of brinkmanship here at the moment you know, do they have anything in reserve at the Holden Racing Team or has McLaughlin really got a wriggle on here and is able to actually change things? Look at the battle back here involving Bright, Percat, Caruso. The young guys side by side to the final corner. Watch Not Courtney. much space. Watch Courtney. James will be a beneficiary because of the better corner exit speed. He's going to push his teammate Percat all the way down there. And by being nose to tail, he's displaced Caruso. And that'll be upsetting the back of Percat's car. And it did because he's so close to the rear wing. Oh, and off the road for Rick Kelly at one. So Lowndes makes that spot. When you're that close to the rear wing, it changes the way the cars work in terms of aero. They wriggle in the rear, and you can actually see the cars moving around down there. So Percat's car was moving. Caruso's in stride. Courtney's grabbed him. It's all going on. <laughs> I thought that Courtney was going to do a Craig Lowndes, but Caruso now oh, almost back down the inside of Courtney. That was so close to contact and turn in for turn four. This is the start of it. So Davison down the inside of Bright. This is what fumbled everybody. They all slowed down. Caruso had to go around the outside. So this is the crisscross. Bang, down the inside. Good move. And it started with Jason Bright wide over the top of the hill, and he couldn't gather it back up to get back on the line. Dropped it off the edge a little bit, and that hurt his corner exit speed here through the second last corner through 11. And then that created a bit of congestion through the final turn. And that the subsequent actions to that went all the way down to turn two and three. And the result was that when Courtney was going to do a lounge and pop out, instead of popping out towards the left, which is Check this spot, out. he actually bump drafts him, pushes him through, but and both guys made it through. Focus on the rear of Percat's car. See it just shift right yeah. there? Yeah. That's because of the aero disturbance at the back of it. It happens a lot when you're at Bathurst, going down over the humps. Someone's right behind you. The car walks all over the road. You've got to chase it with the steering. And here's Courtney and Caruso. A little bump there. And Nick Caruso just getting shoved a little wide there. Okay, back live. This is the real gap between Garth Tander, Scotty McLaughlin, and Garth 
has lost the margin and the car is sliding around at the moment. So, despite what Adrian says, they've got a real battle on their hands here. Now that dive you see from McLaughlin. <laughs> that's the, the grey hair of Richard Holway going, don't do that, mate. <laughs> Please don't do that. I've he seen said that it all before. <laughs> he had to do it with the man to my right here, Mark Scave. He had to do it with Craig Lowndes as well. He's very impressed with his young charger, but he wants him to be very careful when he does this stuff. So what Scott does is he just angles the car straight to the apex in a couple of key spots around here, like here. Craig Lowndes typifies that as well, where Tanda much more traditional in the way that he starts with a wider arc from the turning point and then tries to lengthen the straight on the exit portion of the corner. And the cars have got their own strengths and weaknesses, so all of a sudden there's a gap back here again. Let's see what the computer says. It's checking the ventilation, which means that Scott is feeling it a bit out there at the moment. It's exactly 0.48 of a second between Tanda and McLaughlin. How good is this? Got a great battle here for the concluding stages of this Plus Fitness Phillip Island 400 with Garth Tander just narrowly hanging on. And Scotty's having a big run. He's in the draft. He's got the legs. He looks to have a bit of extra grip at the moment, but can he use it? Tander's been around. He's done all this before. He knows how to play the game. He held his elbows up, but can he resist sufficiently? I haven't got the answer to that at the moment, and I don't think either of them quite know how this will play. And at this end of the circuit, McLaughlin is mega. But at the other end, Tanda's got it over him at the moment at the top end of the hill. And then down off the other side of that and through the last two corners. Blake Smith on data at the Holton Racing Team, Adrian Burgess. Rob Starr's over there as well. Meantime, down at Volvo, Richard Holway's watching very carefully, taking note, writing down lap times giving him a bit of counsel on the radio. They're more active on their radio than I've heard Garth Tander. Garth not saying much at the moment. He's got his hands full. Now, from this point on, 
Tanda's been able to just resist the pressure, but he's right on the grip edge. It's from this point here where Tanda's been able to take a bit of the heat out. What's it look like this lap? Scotty's been having a bit of strife over the top of the hill. No, he's maintained on this lap. He's right there. But look, he's, Garth's very good out of the drive at the very rear good. of the car, out of the hole there in second gear. That gives him the breather he needs into the last corner because if McLaughlin was closer through the last corner, he'd get savaged at the bottom of the straight. So the drive out of the right-hander at turn 10 at MG corner is what's saving Garth Tander at the moment. Exactly. And that's the cat and mouse game. You've got to position the car and Garth, if he makes a little mistake out of 10 to 11, that will give McLaughlin the chance to dive down the inside at one. He's had a couple of half goes. He's been almost there a couple of times. But you can see McLaughlin, what he does is he turns in early. It's the classic case of two different styles. Tanda turning much later, much later apex. Tends to straighten the exit of the corner up. Young Scott does a Craig Lowndes technique of turning it in early. This is the technique, especially at this next corner. Out of four, you go through a little kink at five and into six at Siberia. Check this out, because you just watch Garth. He's out wide. The other guy, Scott McLaughlin, on the inside. My radio broke up at the critical point, but I'm joining the dots. Uh, Krusty, Richard Holway, gave Scott McLaughlin a bit of timing information. He gave him the gap to Mark Winterbottom. He came back and said, I don't care about that bloke. I'm after the one in front. And he well and truly is at the moment. So that was a, don't worry me about the gaps. I've got missile lock going at the moment on Garth Tander. But remember that Garth's vastly experienced, more than 500 V8 supercar races. He's a Bathurst champion. He's a series champion. And he's done a lot of it. The bloke behind, he's still learning the ropes, but he's been very effective very quickly as well. This is a great game of experience versus youth, Larko. Yeah, well, if he's going to have to pounce uh, Neil, he's going to have to make a good job of it because that, those two different lines you talk about, when when uh, Scotty turns in early there, uh, Garth will be seeing that in his mirror, lap on lap. But if he gets it done, well, he's going to get a toe here. No. When he puts it in there, he's going to absolutely have to put it all the way up there. And as you know, Garth will continue to shut that door down. That's the way he drives the car. But yesterday in, in the race where Scotty had Craig Lowndes right behind him. He was wise enough to give the car a little bit of a breather. And I just wonder if that's what he's done this last lap or two. Give the tyres a little rest so for the last two or three, he can have a real crack at him. Yeah, that's exactly right, Lucko. That's 100% uh, your read is right. Oh, Tanda almost missed the turn in then. And it's one of the dangers of Phillip Island in terms of technique. Because if you use the late turning technique, a little mistake holds you wide forever. That's just this different line that we're talking about. And when you do the Craig Lowndes or Scott McLaughlin style, you, you tend to give yourself, it's less risk, you give yourself more road. Now sometimes it's slower because you do compromise the exit of the corner. You have to tighten the line, it's not the perfect race line. But what they're doing and what McLaughlin has been doing the whole race is what I call driving it on the front tyre. So when he turns the car in, he keeps the momentum up by keeping the front tyre loaded. And this is it. So when you're wide, great shot here on our Gillette replay because he just misses, Tanda just misses the turn in. Battles to retard the car. Remember you're going from 250K to 75K. If you can't get it turned, you run slightly wide and almost, that was almost the mistake that McLaughlin's looking for. Scope here, this is gonna happen. It's gonna happen because Scott gets a run on him out of the final turn and he isn't quite there yet, but it's brewing. So if he can just keep on needling Garth to use more of that rear tyre, because at the moment Garth's got a drive advantage in second gear in one spot, maybe two. So low speed traction for him in second gear out of this next turn, turn four is helping Garth. Mind you, the car's pretty good everywhere, so I'm, I'm zoning in on one thing that's critical. Garth slows it up a bit more, turns it in from a more traditional angle, fires off here, bang, he's got a tiny breather. That just gives him enough relief to get through this next sequence at six and seven and then eight. Scott does the lounge. He gets very close on turning because he rushes the corner. He loads the right front corner of the car more than Garth does. Garth's shedding the load across the car a bit more. Now he's vulnerable here again, but what happens? He's got blue in the rear vision mirror everywhere over the top of Lukey Heights. It looks like he's going to be attacked, but that he's focusing very, very carefully on the drive here in second. Watch this. 
Bam. Straightens it. Makes sure the car drives equally on both rear tyres out the other side. But it's getting worse every lap. Every lap, that right. little advantage that he had earlier is eking away. So what McLaughlin's looking for here is the opportunity to be closer at this point. That little slide, that was it. That that was little it. slide for Tander is the telltale. This is it. He's on him. He's going to be all over him at the bottom of the straight. Those couple of Ks make a difference. And here goes McLaughlin down the inside. Oh. Gate closed. 285 Ks and Tander's offline. It's disturbing the rear of the car. And Gas now going out of that comfort zone. Now, this will happen as repeat cycle. So it'll happen again down here at four. Look for it again up at eight and nine. And then 10 in that right-hander. But Tander's now being mega pressured. He's beginning to get outside the comfort of the balance of this car and the tyre behaviour. McLaughlin again down the inside. Can't get it done there. Garth is very, very good under brakes. In fact, I went for a ride with him on a drive day once, and I said, just show me what you do. I want to actually witness it from the left-hand seat. And I watched his braking. It was very special. Now, a little bit of a gap's opened up here. Is there a drama? Was that a drama? Why? But why did he have it? We saw the slide, but why? Why? What happened there? So now he's got to try and reconnect. That's taken a bit of the pressure off. Just a great battle, isn't it? I love watching this stuff. Now, what happened here? Why? No, he, he, just, he, just was the, he actually fired it in so hard it lit the rears up. Big slide. Got away with it. And Garth's looking for the same thing, so... No evidence of uh, brake chatter, but we saw on that previous Gillette replay that uh, as he threw the nose in, which is one of the problems with that technique Style, because you yeah. transfer weight so aggressively to the front, in this case, right-hand corner of the car, rotates the rear. So it's got to go through the whole process again. The problem is that every millimetre, every tiny little bit of ground that you make, you've got to sneak it back. It's like, it's like pulling in a rope. Look at that one. How's the loss on that last lap? Half a second. So two greens, two reds. I love these battles. And these are very enjoyable from the driver's seat. So both drivers are relishing this. They're right, they're maximising everything they've got. They're maximising everything. They can feel every crack in the road, they, every vibration in the car. They understand innately what the tyres are doing, how the engine's behaving, how much mid-corner grip it's got. A fascinating contest. And there's another one going here for third and fourth between Winterbottom and Wind Cup. And you know what Garth's done? That little mistake with McLaughlin. Garth has put his head down, said, I'm going to drive this car as hard as I can possibly drive it so that the blue car does not catch me. <laughs> so he is, I, I want to escape. I want to take the pressure off myself, but I'm going to do it by doing qualifying laps. I'm going to use every zack of tyre grip, every little millimetre of road to make sure that I maintain this gap and I make it hard for Scott McLaughlin to get back at me. There's only a lap and a half to go. Scott dropped off that half a second. And now he's got to make sure he's back to 0.8 of a second out of turn 11. He will do everything also, young Scott, to get back at the HRT Commodore. I reckon he broke the thread, Scofie. I reckon in that little moment down there at Siberia was the telling moment. They're talking about fuel. Fuel, they're all talking about fuel. Everyone is. So there's four guys. Yeah, so uh, on our early maths before Larko confirmed what he could see on the sight tubes on the side of the tanks, we knew it was going to be tight. But I don't know that McLaughlin's going to get this one back. Now remember the Tander was a race winner in Townsville earlier this year. This will be a welcome relief for him because it would have been gut-wrenching what happened to him at Mount Panorama with he and Warren Luff and the damage to the car. And McLaughlin's got back again, but it's a little artificial because the dive and just the natural seesaw as the cars arrive and depart the corner means that the gap looks to change, but once they stabilise on the other side of the straight, it settles down again. I don't know that Scotty can get him, but he's put up a very, very good performance to try and lay a punch. Enjoyed the battle. And hasn't Tanda been rock solid? He has not blinked. He looked like he was going to, but he hasn't blinked. <laughs> Well, that little slide coming onto the straight was the only little murmur. We just saw a little mistake, and it, it was only because he was just pressing on as hard as he possibly could. Scott couldn't capitalise, and what a great battle it's been with these two guys. The experienced man with an unbelievable young operator, Cropper. So final turn now, car number two, Garth Tander. 
Bathurst champion of years gone by. Oh, he's in trouble. He's run out of fuel. He's run out of fuel. You cannot. I was sitting up, sitting up to talk about Tanda, and the opposite has applied. Scott McLaughlin has won this race. Scott McLaughlin and Volvo oh snatched God. it. They snatched it with 100 metres to go. They got it on the whole racing team. I was setting up to talk about a victory for Tanda, and so were they. And all of a sudden it coughed. And this man, the youngest man in the field, has done it for the second day running. Scott McLaughlin, Valvoline, Volvo, Polestar, get the job done. Unbelievable. We thought it was done. Yeah. All of a sudden, bam, down the inside comes Scotty McLaughlin. It's his fourth victory of 2014. The second day running, he's picked up a victory. Here's the replay oh. from on board Scott. And he must have thought that Santa arrived in November. And you can see Garth trying to slosh fuel around in the collector, trying to get fuel picked up. Well, it's never over till it's over. That is unbelievable. Isn't it? Look at the reaction. <laughs> Check him out. How's the that? fist pumping. I mean, you just could not read that. That was We all thought that was going to be close in terms of fuel consumption. But what great shots now from the Valvoline Volvo S60. And another win for McLaughlin this year. Sensational job. And that's the replay. Garth was a little, there's a bit of gamesmanship in the move over, but he knew he, if he moved it over any further, he would have got hit. And look at all the boys, Adrian Raskin and all the guys looking down there. They cannot believe they've been robbed with 100 metres to go. Well, that caught the entire pit lane by surprise. They gutted at the Holden Racing Team. One man's loss is another's gain for Scott McLaughlin. It's a victory. Maximum points. And I did not think that was going to happen. We knew fuel was tight. We didn't realise it was quite that tight. He'll have a grin from ear to ear, this young man. He did a beautiful job yesterday. It was the, it was the pressure of the drive yesterday that impressed everybody. And this is the Holden Racing Team duo with Garth Tander giving his, uh, getting a bit of a hand from his old mate, James Courtney. Well, one of the professional race driver code of ethics is never walk home. Oh, well done, mate. <laughs> That's right. So... That's a push, and uh, James Courtney's just resting car 22 against car 2 to push the factory car home. Tanda. Yeah. So what Garth's talking about there is the Highlands 101. Last week he drove an Aston Martin with Tony Quinn, VIP Pet Foods entry, and it was the other way round. The Erebus Benz ran out of gas, and then they won. So it just goes to show the seesaw fortunes of Australasian motorsport. That was across in New Zealand, just outside Queenstown. So Garth's pretty philosophical about it, but it was a beautiful drive by both those men this afternoon. Both Garth Tander and Scott McLaughlin did an outstanding job of high pressure, high quality motorsport. In the end, Scott McLaughlin prevails from Garth Tander. Mark Winterbottom home in third, but we didn't see a lot of that because of the incredible excitement of what went on here with this man in particular. I just was blown away then. I started looking at bits of paper going, oh, Garth Tander's done this and he's done well. He's actually lost the race. <laughs> Whoops. It was a good battle at the back of, the, of that race also. Wig Cup got right to the back of Winterbottom. Van Gisberg and a good bounce back. Will Davison, great job to be sixth. Bright, Perkett, Caruso, Caruso Knight. So all five manufacturers in the top nine. Young Scott McLaughlin for Volvo as the factory team. What a great first year in V8 supercars. That's awesome. You're a bloody ripper. Yeah. <laughs> of course he said that. Yeah. We agree, Scotty. And I'm sure everybody at home does too. It's an infectious enthusiasm and I'm sure there was a round of applause all around Australia for Australian motorsport fans on that one. He's a likeable character. He's doing a brilliant job at the moment and he lights up the Valvoline Volvo down there at turn four in celebration. He pulls maximum points 150 of them today. That helps his cause no end in the championship battle. He's still in there as well for the Miners. Let's get amongst it with Barretts. Well, Scotty McLaughlin, you just never know how you're going to win the celebration with Dad. Scott, congratulations. That was a tremendous duel between you and Garth Tander, and you snatched it at the end. Look, uh, I feel... Uh, 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 it's hard. I'm, I'm so pumped right now, but I feel for Garth. He drove an awesome race. That's all I had. And if it wasn't for that, he would have won the race. So um, 
I've seen it happen before. I never ever thought that would happen to me, but I'm so glad and so happy for everyone at Valvoline Racing GRM, and Volvo Polestar. And this is awesome. Let's go. I've got, got some more good news. You skipped up to fifth in the championship. Well, that's our aim. Um, we've just got to keep keep pushing on. I'm not, not winning championships, but that's a big effort for our little team down down in Long South. So to everyone at home um, and all my supporters, thank you very much. A, this is amazing. Great work, Scott. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, as you said, Neil, one man's misfortune is another man's victory. You're on the wrong side of it this time, Garth Tander. That's heartbreaking. Oh, that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes, <laughs> Brett. But um, can't thank our guys enough. They did a fantastic job. Uh, I didn't. This wasn't really thinking it was going to be one of our strong tracks this year. But um, guys did an awesome job in the lead up. Car was fantastic yesterday, and uh, about uh, 100 metres that come up, 100 metres short. But uh, thanks very much to all our guys, to all our supporters. Um, looking forward to Sydney. We all enjoyed that great duel. We'll see you in Sydney. Well done, GT. Thanks. Mark Winterbottom, good news for you championship-wise. From 44 points, you've widened that gap to 95 points. That's the positive of the weekend. I know on the start line, too, you wanted to make a point. You wanted to bounce back and get back on the podium today, so well done. Yeah, it's uh, it's good for the boys and, and the girls at the workshop. I'm uh, pretty happy with uh, with that. You know, that's that's all we've got. And when you can get the best result out of all you got, that's what you got to be happy with. But um, pretty epic battle. I wondered why McLaughlin was doing donuts and Tan to come in. But, uh, yeah, good race, good way to finish. And... We'll go to Sydney, but uh, hey, Renee, the boys went home. They um, got out of here early, so uh, I'm bringing home a trophy. That little kiss Oliver gave me at work. Thanks, buddy. Good work. Let's go and grab that trophy. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Hey, Will Davidson, it's nice to come and talk to you on a positive note, mate, at the back end of the year. Position six, and a position six is a very tough earn today. Uh, and we, we did earn it as yeah. well. We definitely didn't luck into that. We uh, got a ripping start from 12th into 9th, stayed out. Um, Everything was running so smoothly. I jumped a lot of cars in the first stop, and then I was actually catching Frosty and Jamie. And I was like, geez, I'm actually going to have a go at these guys. And then that safety car came out, and then I got jammed in the pit lane here, and I lost about four positions. So I was pretty shattered with that. Uh, but we had a quick car, and um, just a credit to the guys, we rolled out a really difficult car Friday morning, and to end up with a car that handled as good as it did then. I mean, we know what our deficiencies still are, but um, the car was, was bang on. I was running the pace of the leaders, and... Um, Credit to the guys, really proud of them. Mate, I just wonder though, uh, I see this is a really unusual thing, the window's fallen out and you say that was quite weird inside, buffeting around inside, eh? Well, the, the actual, the windshield, the perspect wind, wind, windscreen was massive buffeting. I didn't actually know it was caused by this and it was, I kept saying, it feels like I've got a parachute out the back of the car because it was really slow in the straight and Brighty's just come up to me and said, when your window flew off, it's ripped his mirror off. Right. So um, I wasn't aware till the end, but that'll explain the, the parachute effect I was talking about. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm really happy. Rock on Sydney, mate. You're doing a good job. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. He did a great job, Will Davison and we made that observation in the call earlier on that when that window pops out, they buff it and carry on badly in the cabin. So Scotty McLaughlin got it done by just a little uh, under half a second in the final analysis. Caught everybody by surprise, but it was intense and it was great to see so many brands up there doing well, battling in the top ten at the end of the race. The podium is set. Let's get to Barrett's. The Fitness Plus Phillip Island 400 introducing our winning drivers for race 35 of the year. In first place for Valvoline Racing GRM, Scott McLaughlin. In second place for the Holden Racing Team, Garth Tander. And in third place for Ford Pepsi Max crew, Mark Winterbottom. Representing the winning team, Valvoline Racing GRM, is Jacob Rayner making the presentation of our third place trophy is Samra Tripodi, Chief Financial Officer from our naming rights sponsor, Plus Fitness. <laughs> Presenting to second place is the National Fleet Sales Manager, Kenworth Trucks, Stephen May. <laughs> making the presentation to our winning team is the General Manager of Plus Fitness, Amy Dory. And presenting the first place trophy from our major sponsor this weekend, Plus Fitness Chief Executive Officer, John Fuller. Yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, the 2014 V8 Supercars Plus Fitness, Phillip Island 400 race 35 winners. Well done to the boys. 
There's a bit of, bit of champagne, a bit of bubbly being spread around down there at the moment. We'll get the, our focus back and look at the champ points, though, because it's a 4.52 margin at the moment, Wind Cup and Winterbottom. And then uh, Craig Lowndes hanging on in third spot there at the moment, Shane Van Gisbergen in fourth place. And, of course, there's been a bit of movement behind that as well because Scotty McLaughlin has moved up. He looks pretty strong. So it's been another wonderful battle here at Phillip Island this weekend.